What's going on? We're about two weeks into internship season and that's about as long as it took for me to actually understand what my project is even on. I'm gonna use this video to talk about it. So I'm doing an internship, a summer internship at Jefferson Lab in Newport News. And what that whole place is, is it's a particle accelerator. It's the largest nuclear physics research facility in the world, actually, so it's very cool to be a part of. The thing that I'm doing isn't nuclear research, though, it's, it's accelerator physics, theoretical accelerator physics, to be more precise. I'm getting ahead of myself, so the whole idea behind Jefferson Lab is they want to find out what the smallest things are and how those smallest things interact. The way that they do that, to paraphrase one of my professors, is they do it kind of the same way that a five-year-old would. They smash stuff together and they look at the the remains and they look at it and say, this is smaller than that, therefore it's more fundamental. Um, it's not exactly like that, but it's a good enough analogy. So they smash these particles together, electrons and ideally neutrons, but neutrons are inherently unstable when they're outside of a nucleus. So they'll typically have like either a proton or some kind of isotope like uh, deuterium or tritium and they'll fire electrons at it, bombard it, smash the nucleus up and study what happens through like, the scattering that the electrons do off of that. Now, protons are roughly 2,000 times more massive than electrons, so why do we shoot something so much less massive and expect to break it apart? Well, the electrons are moving with a lot of energy. Think about it this way, the way that we ever describe how big something is, is to use smaller things to describe it. You would say, how big is a mile? Well, it's as big as so many feet. You know what I'm saying? You use smaller things to quantify the larger things. But through a particle accelerator, you're bombarding it, bombarding these particles, these uh, nucleons with electrons, observing the scattering and observing how these things break apart. And that's how you decide and deduce what the object you're studying is actually doing, how, what makes it tick. Now when you're shooting these ions at these cluster of particles, you want as dense a beam as possible, right? Because that means more collisions per second, that's more data per second. Uh, when these ions come out of the beam, they're not so dense, so there needs to be a way to make them more dense and make a more concentrated beam, kind of like a laser. And the way that they do that is if you picture this beam of ions as being really hot, meaning having a lot of average kinetic energy, what we call transverse energy, so energy of kind of orbiting around it per se, it's not longitudinal, not in a straight line. You can think of that as it being hot. Uh, the way to make it less or more dense is you can shoot a beam of electrons above those ions at the same relative velocity that are cold. And what this does, you don't have to have a whole course in thermodynamics to know that if you have a cold thing next to a hot thing, the cold thing gets hotter and the hot thing gets colder. That's the, that's the idea of electron cooling, and that's what I'm essentially making my contribution to. So as you shoot these, these electrons over these ions, the electrons get warmer and the ions get colder. The colder it gets, the less uh, transverse energy the beam has, and the tighter it gets. And that's, that's what we want. So you could say, okay, well why not just have like a huge current in an electron gun shooting over it at the same velocity. Problem solved. You can get as dense a beam as you want. And you're right for thinking that. That would completely work. It's just absolutely inefficient. The, I think the world record electron gun that has been made, I think it was made in Fermilab, and it's on the order of about 75 milliamps. The current we would need in order to get the beam as dense as we want it would have to go up to about an amp. So 75 milliamps, that's what? Seven, 75 times 10 to the minus three amps. So that's about, we're about, 10 or so times off. We're over an order of magnitude off from that. Um, which is a lot because it was a struggle for them to make that 75 milliamp gun. So we need another method by which we can get that beam tighter. And this is where I come in. So there was a PhD student that learned that, okay, well instead of just having current flowing over it, why don't we cool off these ions and recycle them? 
So if you want to start recycling these electrons, it's not so clear how many bunches you should let go by before you do them again. So there's these things called cavities in a particle accelerator, which basically supply a magnetic field. And for reasons we don't need to get into, that makes it so that you don't necessarily have to have that continuous current anymore. You can get the same result by creating this magnetic field at a particular frequency, which can be made by summing harmonics. That's a fancy way of describing an even fancier equation that's right here. And this equation right here is basically what my entire project is about. It's telling us that we can create this magnetic field in a cavity by summing cosines and sine waves. Um, and what this corresponds to is, let's, is letting so many bunches of electrons go by and I want to find the perfect amount of electrons to go by and the perfect combination of, you see these A sub I's that are up here as well, the perfect combination of these A sub I's that gives me the smallest value of this F min. So, like I said, I'm, or I don't know if I said it actually, but I'm the optimization guy essentially. I'm running a computer program in the programming language called Python, which is going to make that function that I just showed you as small as possible by selecting for those A sub I's that yield the smallest answer. But let's backtrack a little bit. So the main important things about my project is understanding that there are two things that it depends on. One, making sure that we're not doing this record-breaking current or uh, electron gun. And two, finding the right combination of subharmonics that yield the smallest value because it's an optimization problem. We want the smallest value. Um, as my advisor puts it, this is a good way of learning how to spread the pain to make sure that everyone is equally unhappy. So let me walk you through what I've been doing so far. So, so far, I needed to learn Python. That was step one, right? Um, the first thing that I wanted to do is I took this equation, that nasty equation I just showed you, and I made sure that I could program it such that if I put in specific values for that a sub i, that it spits out a value for the function. That was goal number one. Goal number two, is taking the first part of that function, which is this one right here, and seeing what that looks like for some m. You know what I'm saying? So if I were to plug in some value for m, or I think in my equation it's n, which is just m minus one. Um, so I put in some value for m, put in a bunch of values for my a sub i, and then it graphs it for me. And that gives you so much more perspective as to what you're actually looking at. So guys, if you're ever solving a problem and you don't really know where to go from there, plot it out. This is weird lighting. I'm not gonna be near the weird lighting. We're leaving. Okay, so goal number one was to program this function such that I can plug stuff in and I actually get an answer out. Goal number two is what does this shit look like? So far, those are good, and I'm getting sensible answers by this is another really important thing, is find yourself as much symmetry arguments as you can make because that'll help you find the trivial solutions that you need. And in math they always tell you, and it's completely right, that you can't prove anything with a specific case, but God it can give you so much insight as to what you're actually working with. So the next step, like I said, is developing the minimization routine. And uh, the way I'm going to go about that is exactly like I said, you guys should utilize these tools when you're solving these kinds of problems. Symmetry arguments and special cases are going to be my best friend here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the analytic solutions that I know to be true for those A sub I values, but I'm going to withhold that information from my program. I'm going to withhold it so that I can test against it and when I have my minimization routine I'm gonna make it converge to those I'm gonna make it converge to some solution coefficients that minimize the function subject to such and such constraints and 
It better get me the answer that I know already is the answer for the special case. This is where the computer comes in because if you noticed, let's bring up this equation one more time. So you see that it's summed all the way to n. So if n is n minus 1, for our case we're using the 11th harmonic. So that's n equal to 10. So in that equation, you see that a sub i is going to go from 0 to 11. So we've got 11 squared, so that's 121 terms in that one part of the equation. Um, so you can see how this equation just, it's, yes, it could be analytic. There's no reason why you couldn't solve it by hand, but it would take way too long and your, your time is worth more than that. So that's where the computer comes in, that way I don't have to do that. So once it starts converging to the value that I know to be true, that's where I kind of have to put my trust into this code and let it converge to the values that I have no idea over dimensions that I just can't do by hand. Like Yeah, so I've been uh, learning all of this programming stuff in Python, or I've been learning Python, trying to learn Python. I don't know Python. Um, and a really good source that I saw that's phenomenal if it's like your first programming language is called something that I can't remember, but I'm going to post a link in the description if anyone's interested in getting started with programming because I think it's such a good tool to have. And uh, so yeah, just, so just check the link in the description and that'll start you off with Python. It's, it's kind of hard to download and install and stuff, but after that it gets a lot easier. So it's unfortunate, the one thing that's unfortunate about this is that since Jefferson Lab is technically government property, I'm not at the liberty to record every single thing that I see, especially the meetings that I go to, but I do it because I have like a badge. It's like, you're qualified to go in here, which is kind of cool. I just got my clearance to actually go into the particle accelerator, which is even more cooler because where my office is, it's just a cubicle on the seventh floor where I just sit by a computer and, and crunch code all day. Which, when said like that, sounds bad, but I think it's awesome. I think it's so much fun. Because I get to do math all day, and I get to do math on a computer. Uh, sounds like I'm being sarcastic, but I actually like that. This minimization routine is, is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, I'm sure to a regular a computational physicist or something, this would be, they'd be done in a day. But that's because they already know how to solve the problem. And you can say that about any kind of problem. If you know how to solve it already, of course it's gonna take them less time. I'm gonna try to record as much of this internship as possible, just to serve as a reference for people that are uh, looking at doing a summer internship if they're interested in physics. And you don't have to be a physics major to have this kind of internship. There's math majors, mechanical engineering students, uh, dance majors. I'm just kidding. There's no dance majors. Um, but yeah, I just, I want, I want people to be able to look at this channel and at the end of the video say, okay, I know what to expect now. That's, that's really what I want to do with this entire channel. So throughout the next few weeks, I'm going to be putting up, you know, breakthroughs I've had with this internship, plateaus and brick walls that I've hit. I want you guys to see it all. I want you guys to really see what it's like. And now it's the beginning of stages, so the beginning stages, so there's not too much, but you guys are gonna see everything. So I know it must not have been too much fun just watching me talk. Uh, the next videos will definitely have more, less of a monologue between me and the camera because I kind of hate doing that. Uh, I'd like to be able to talk to more of the other student interns and see how their stuff is going. Show you guys the lab, show you guys my cubicle. Uh, yeah, so stay tuned for the next episode of Dragon Ball Z.